Hey, this is Off the Cuff, and I'm Steve from TorahFamily.org. We find it interesting how the majority of ministers today say the law is no longer for us to follow. Yet, they are quick to say how you should pay your tithes to their church, all the while knowing that tithing is straight from the law. You know, the very thing they say we no longer have to follow. Yet, this particular instruction still applies, of course. It's generally believed the tithing system was set up for the Levites and the priests. And this is true, in part. As we will find in this teaching, there are other tithes that were not designated to go to the priests in general. Scripturally speaking, there are basically four types of tithes. The Levitical tithe, the festival tithe, the poor tithe, and the priest's tithe. This teaching will go over these with giving a basic understanding of them all. However, it must be understood that all tithes besides the festival tithe and the poor tithe were intended for either the priests or the Levites. Since there are no priests, Levites, or temple in existence today, biblically speaking, you can't tithe in obedience to those commands. When Yeshua, that being Jesus, returns and sets up his kingdom, he will reestablish the temple and all that applies to it. But that's another teaching in itself. Now, this is not to say that someone can't willingly give 10% to a ministry or even split it up among several ministries. We think it's great that people do this. We're simply saying this means that one can't obey these instructions as directed in the scriptures. Modern day ministers have no biblical foundation to say that the paying of the tithes has been transferred over to them and is now to be paid to the modern church. <laughs> I once heard a minister say there is no verse in the Bible that says one should split their tithes up between different ministries. But at the same time, there is no verse that says the tithe should go to a pastor either. <laughs> it goes to the temple for the Levites and the priesthood. And those don't exist today. And please know, there is no verse that discusses acting Levites. This is a term that many have taken up in saying they are the acting Levites of the modern day. So you have to pay tithes to them. But again, there is no verse that discusses anything of the like. Everything that applies to the priests and Levites stays with the priests and Levites. Yet still, many ministers today will tell you that you're sinning by not giving tithes to the church. So, let's look at the four basic types of tithes as given in the scriptures. First, the Levitical tithe. This is given by all Israel to the Levites. Numbers chapter 18. I give the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. From now on, the Israelites must not go near the tent of meeting or they will bear the consequences of their sin and will die. It is the Levites who are to do the work at the tent of meeting and bear the responsibility for offenses against it. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. They will receive no inheritance among the Israelites. Instead, I give to the Levites as their inheritance the tithes that the Israelites present as an offering to Yahweh. That is why I said concerning them, they will have no inheritance among the Israelites. Then we have the festival tithe. This tithe is actually set apart for you. <laughs> yes, you heard me right, for you. We don't hear pastors talking much about this tithe, do we? It's designated to make sure you have what you need for you and your friends at the festivals the feast days, to basically throw a big party. Seriously, to have a big feast celebrating the holy days of Yahweh. 
Yahweh wants you to have a great time celebrating his days. The instructions for this tithe are found in Deuteronomy 14. It shows how one is to take their tithe to where the temple will be, which became Jerusalem, and to celebrate the festivals there with their tithes. If they lived too far away from where the temple was, they were to sell their tithe, take the money they made from it, and go to the city where the temple was, and spend that money on the provisions needed for the festival. It's during these feast days where the men are to appear before Yahweh, and they are not to appear empty-handed. This is detailed here in Deuteronomy chapter 16. If you notice here in verse 17, they are not required to bring a tithe before the Lord here, but rather a gift in proportion to how they were blessed. This is also noted here in verse 10. This is because the tithes were spent on you during these times to make sure you had an awesome time celebrating the feasts of Yahweh. Now, from here we have what is referred to as the poor tithe. These are the provisions that were given to those in need. Deuteronomy 14. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns, so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the alien, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied, and so that Yahweh your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. It is again referred to in chapter 26. This would be one that can be followed still today. From there, we have the priest's tithe. These tithes were to be paid by the Levites and went to the priests. Consider Numbers chapter 18. Yahweh said to Moses, Speak to the Levites and say to them, When you receive from the Israelites the tithe I give you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe as Yahweh's offering. Your offering will be reckoned to you as grain from the threshing floor or juice from the winepress. In this way, you also present an offering to Yahweh from all the tithes you receive from the Israelites. From these tithes, you must give Yahweh's portion to Aaron the priest. You must present as Yahweh's portion the best and holiest part of everything given to you. Say to the Levites, when you present the best part, it will be reckoned to you as the product of the threshing floor or the winepress. You and your households may eat the rest of it anywhere, for it is your wages for your work at the tent of meeting. By presenting the best part of it, you will not be guilty in this matter. Then you will not defile the holy offerings of the Israelites, and you will not die. The Levites and priests were set apart for their position when Moses first received the instructions from Yahweh. Because of this position, they were not given land as the other tribes were. This is described here in Deuteronomy 18. They were allowed cities, but not territories. They had 48 cities within the territories of the other tribes, as shown here in Numbers 35. The Levites were given the tithes in return for their work in the temple. The tithes they received were livestock, grains, and fruit. And the tithe was to be the best of what you had. Along this line, one could substitute their tithe with money instead, but they were actually charged 20% for it, one-fifth. This is shown here in Leviticus 27. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is Yahweh's. It is holy to Yahweh. If a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. Now, there are two ways of interpreting this verse. One, if you choose to redeem your tithe, you are to add one-fifth of the total value to the tithe. Thus, it would go from 10% to 30% 
because of adding the one-fifth, which is adding 20%. Or two, if you choose to redeem your tithe, you are to add one-fifth of the value of the tithe. One-fifth of 10% is 2%, thus resulting in 12% being what is to be paid as a result of paying in the form of money. Either of these two interpretations could be correct, depending on one's view of the Hebrew text. We lean to the 12% interpretation at this time. However, the point here is there was a penalty for paying in the form of money instead of what came from the crops, flocks, or herds. Now, a general understanding is that all male Levites were or became priests, but this is not the case. Only the descendants of Aaron were the priests. The descendants of Aaron were indeed Levites, but only they were to be the priests. However, the rest of the male Levites were to be servants for the priests. And again, the priests were the descendants of Aaron. This is found in multiple verses, like Exodus 28, verse 41. Exodus 28, verse 43. Exodus 29.9 Exodus 29.44 Leviticus 6.9 Leviticus 7.35 Leviticus 21.1 and Numbers 18.1 So it's clear that only the descendants of Aaron are to be priests in the earthly temple. Even Yeshua, our high priest in heaven, is forbidden to be a priest in the earthly temple. Consider Hebrews chapter 8. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. Again, the earthly priesthood is set apart only for the descendants of Aaron. No one else the rest of the Levites were given to the descendants of Aaron as helpers. They were to be in charge of taking care of the tent of meeting, but only the descendants of Aaron were to be the priests, as seen here in Numbers chapter 18, verses 2 through 7. Though the Levites, who were not from Aaron, were not priests, they still received tithes as their wages. Numbers 18. I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance, in return for their work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. In all of this, it's clear that the tithes went to the priests and the Levites for their duties in the temple. Nowhere in the scriptures do we see the tithes transferred from them to pastors or teachers today. This is not to say we can't help or support ministries today, but nowhere in the scriptures are we told to pay tithes to anyone other than what has been directed in the Torah. There's just no way around it. We find Paul discussing that we should be cheerful givers and that we reap according to how we sow. Giving is something we're encouraged to grow in as well. This is something seen in David found in 2 Samuel. But the king replied to Arana, No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to Yahweh my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David could have received it all for nothing, but David wouldn't do it. This is a verse many overlook when it comes to giving, but it sets a great example from the man who became noted by Yahweh as the man after his own heart. So even though biblical tithing is not something we can obey today, we can still give to those ministries that spread the eternal gospel. However, it's not just in supporting ministries. Consider James chapter 1. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
And let's not forget Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And what of those on his left? They didn't do these things. And they didn't enter in either. Again, this is not to say that one can't give 10% to their fellowship or a ministry they listen to. We're simply saying, if one chooses to do so, it's simply considered a free will offering in the eyes of Yahweh, as it's not going to the Levites or the priests, which is prescribed in the Word. <laughs> we know many refer to Malachi chapter 3 in saying we should still tithe today. So, let's look at it. But, let's read verse 7, which is often overlooked. It says, Ever since the times of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you says Yahweh Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says Yahweh Almighty and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. When we look, this is all about returning to the decrees found in the law, the Torah. It says, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Returning to his decrees. And as shown in these verses, Tithing was one of those decrees. Yet, as noted before, tithing is something we're unable to do today because of, well, no Levites, priests, or a temple. We're in a similar circumstance like those taken captive to Babylon. They were unable to obey all of the law since they no longer had the temple. Yet, there are many elements of the law we can return to today. And so, like Daniel, living in Babylon, we pursue all that we can. Though tithing is not one of them, we do what we can. But what about Yeshua? Surely he said something about tithing that New Testament believers could follow regarding this topic. However, his words on tithing were very, very few. In fact, the one time we see him addressing it was when he was slamming the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. Consider his words. Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, 
and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. The Pharisees were faithful in their tithing, so let's give them credit where credit is due. However, look at the last part of what Yeshua said. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Now, was tithing important? Of course it was. But it was considered something basic, elementary, something that required little effort to obey. Yet the Pharisees made it something they focused on so heavily that they neglected the more important matters of the law, including justice, mercy, and faithfulness. For if they had focused on these, the tithing would have come naturally. Yet, in all of this, there is still no words of instruction to transfer the tithes to someone other than the Levites or the priests. Many have said that just as Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek before the Levites and the priesthood, we now pay tithes to the pastors of churches today. This sounds good, but we have no instructions given for that anywhere in the scriptures. Nowhere are we informed to pay tithes to pastors or churches. There's no doubt we're instructed to give, just not tithing. There are many questions that surround tithing in regards to whom they would have been paid to before the law was given through Moses. There was no temple, no Levites or priests. Yet, as already mentioned, we know not all tithes went to the priests. They also went to the poor, as already mentioned in Deuteronomy 14. Now, could this have been where they went beforehand? Possibly. Yet we also know tithes were given to Melchizedek, one who was noted as a priest. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Many refer to the time when Abram, later known as Abraham, gave a tenth to Melchizedek, king of Salem. He was noted as a priest of Yahweh. Though little is known about Melchizedek, Abram gave a tenth of the spoils from the war he and his family fought to save Lot. Many refer to this verse now saying we should tithe to the church today. But if we are to use this verse to support tithing for today, well, what about the other 90%? What did Abram do with that other 90%? Let's find out. Genesis chapter 14. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything, the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to Yahweh, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me. To Anner, Eskel, and Mamre, let them have their share. He gave the rest to the others. The bottom line here is, if we are going to use this verse in saying we should pay tithes to the church today, then we also have to say we're to give the other 90% to others as well. <laughs> but again, there are no commands or instructions found anywhere in the scriptures for us to do such a thing. Then we have Jacob in Genesis chapter 28. It says, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat 
and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house. Then Yahweh will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Yet we see no one to whom he would have paid the tithes to. There's nothing given in how Jacob filled this vow. The topic of tithing is very vague, to say the least, before it was given through Moses in the Torah. Before these two isolated instances for Abram and Jacob, we see no scriptures to indicate tithing was a regular part of their lives. We're not saying it wasn't, only that the scriptures are silent to us in how this would have been a part of their everyday living. Though we're unable to biblically tithe today, it doesn't mean we shouldn't give to the Father through those who serve. For the Father truly does love a cheerful giver. One example of a free will offering is found in Exodus 35 when the tabernacle was being made. Exodus 35 verse 5. From what you have, take an offering for Yahweh. Everyone who is willing is to bring to Yahweh an offering of gold, silver, and bronze. Then jumping down to verse 21 and 22. And everyone who was willing and whose heart moved him came and brought an offering to Yahweh for the work on the tent of meeting, for all its service, and for the sacred garments. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to Yahweh. Then verse 29, All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to Yahweh free will offerings for all the work Yahweh through Moses had commanded them to do. Then one chapter later we find this. Exodus 36, verses 6 and 7. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more, because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. I can only imagine that had to be a good problem for Moses. Our prayer for you is that you give as the Father directs you. But when you do give, don't give it reluctantly. Give it thankfully, from a joyous heart. We pray you seek the Father in where you should give your offerings and support. And please know, you don't have to have money for money to have you. (laughs) You don't have to be rich to be greedy. You don't have to have a lot of money to serve money. The Father wants us all to grow from where we're at, but we must be focused on serving Him and no other. Luke 16. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and and money. Money is not the root of evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. Please remember that. So where do you stand in regard to loving money? Seriously, think about it for a moment. It's okay to have money. Just don't let money have you. Many believe Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts were killed for not giving all their money from the sale of their property like many others were doing in the book of Acts. But that's not the case. The money was theirs to do whatever they wanted. The problem was they kept some of the money back while wanting everyone to think they were giving it all. Consider Acts chapter 4. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed 
as everyone had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and a great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Again, the money was theirs. It was their choice to do whatever they wanted with it. But they wanted others to think they gave it all like the others who gave all. So, did the money have them? Well, possibly. Along with the pride of wanting others to think they were doing something that they really weren't. They wanted to be seen in what they were doing. Consider now the words of Yeshua and what we should do about being seen in doing something for the Father. Matthew chapter 6. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Don't make it your goal to be seen in your service to Him. This was what Ananias and Sapphira were doing. They wanted to be seen, and so they lied about the money they were giving. Don't let money be the driving force in how you live your life. Remember the words of Yeshua. Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your heart today? Do you serve money? <laughs> Many would brush this question aside as a joke. But we ask that you examine your heart to see what motivates you in regard to money or even things which is purchased by money. Did you know the scriptures say we are a servant to whom we owe money? Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. So, is this wrong? Of course not. We just can't leave that debt as it is. Romans 13. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Again, we see no scripture that says being in debt is a sin. However, the deeper one is in debt, the less they are able to give to the furtherance of the kingdom. And we must never forget as Acts 20 says, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, 
Though these exact words of Yeshua are not recorded in the New Testament, we do have a similar instance to refer to. Luke 14. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When we tie ourselves down to debt, we limit how much we can give to others. So in return, we're only robbing ourselves of blessings that last for eternity. So in conclusion, we are unable to do all of the biblical tithe as instructed in the scriptures. But this doesn't negate the fact that the Father does indeed love a cheerful giver, and we are indeed blessed if we give. Now, not everyone is able to give the same, and we should never compare ourselves to what others give. What's the Father putting on your heart? Whatever it is, be obedient with a joyful heart. I can tell you, as a ministry that relies on support from our listeners, we can say that there is no amount that is too small, and we are truly grateful for every dollar that comes in. So, seek the Father for how much and where He would have you invest into His kingdom. Do so today. Seek Him today with an open heart, asking Him how much and where. If it's $5 a month, a dollar a month, $10 a month, or more, Whatever he puts on your heart. Some people say, well, see, that's not very much. Says the person who's not receiving it. (laughs) All I can say is, again, as a ministry who relies on those of our listeners, we value everything you give us, and we are appreciative and grateful for it. So, again... To all the men, I'm sure I can speak for all the ministries out there who are in our, our situation. You know, just pray. Ask him, Father, where do you want me to give? What do you want me to give? If he doesn't give any, tell you anything specific, then, you know, then don't. Or just follow what you believe he's giving you at the time. But mostly I would say if you don't feel a direction, then don't. (laughs) I got to be honest with you. I hate talking about money because I've seen it abused so much through all of my life growing up in the church. And I really, I have put this teaching off for so long because I never want someone to think that, you know, we're all about money or whatever the case is type thing. That is so not us. I and mean, we need it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you got to live, right? But, but the thing is, I, owe, I guess I owe you an apology because I put this teaching off for so long. So forgive me on that. It's just because I don't like talking this topic. So all I'm asking is that you sincerely seek him on this. Seek him. Follow him. He will provide who needs to be provided. Well, that's all I have. <laughs> Think about it. Pray about it, but more than anything, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Until next time, Shalom.